Welcome everybody to Equipping Hour. Good to see you all. Thanks for being here. Um, one of the things that's uh, just so sweet about being in a church like this, people love to fellowship and um, it's happening constantly from the moment people walk into the front door and then we have to make you leave the building, you know, at the, at the end of the night and things like that. That's great. Um, but also one of the things that's just a, a challenge as well that happens uh, that, I've, that I've noticed when preaching's happening oftentimes, people who are kind of strolling in, getting here, uh, hustling to get here late, there's like a, you know, conversations being being carried on outside uh, and I just want to encourage us to not do that <laughs> uh, you know I love the fellowship that happens constantly but unnecessary conversations things that could be put off while God's words being opened in equipping hour main service evening service just want to encourage us to be discerning try not to be a distraction uh, to others avoid being distracted as well um, and just prioritize uh, getting here and just being, being under the, the word as it's preached. Um, obviously, there, there are plenty of good reasons to be in the narthex while people are finishing breakfast with their family or uh, trying to keep kids uh, contained and stuff like that. Those are great reasons to do that, but Anyway, just want to encourage us to be thoughtful about those things as, as preaching is happening. With that, let me go ahead and pray, and then we'll jump into a, a brief new series this morning. God, thank you so much for your word that gives us light. It is itself light, uh, light to our feet, a, a lamp to our paths, and gives us crystal clear clarity where we need it uh, to discern difficult issues, to discern the matters of our own hearts uh, as best as we can. And God, you've spoken so well uh, and so wisely. I pray this morning that even as we uh, seek to discern a subject uh, that can be so fraught with confusion and misunderstanding and uh, personal investment for some of us perhaps as mental illness, that you would help us to look to your scriptures with uh, ears that are eager to hear, hearts that are inclined to receive your instruction and uh, heed the wisdom that you've given us in the scriptures. So give us understanding this morning, help me to speak clearly, and we pray that you would be glorified uh, by what we do in this equipping hour. In Christ's name, amen. <clears throat> well, this morning does uh, kick off just a, a two-week uh, series, something that uh, has been on my heart for a time for, for our church, actually. And uh, that is the, the matter of, of mental illness. How do we discern mental illness biblically? Uh, this is an issue that has garnered plenty of attention in our day and as well as confusion. And just as a, an introductory note, if you were stepping in um, to, to even realizing that Scripture had something to say about this area of mental health or, or mental illness, as, as it's known, just giving some brief attention to the mere statistics alone should alert us that all is not right. There's, there's uh, something amiss when it comes to how our culture tends to think about the issue of mental illness. And I just want to read, by way of introduction, uh, a, a lengthy quote from Robert Whitaker, his book, Anatomy of an Epidemic, Magic Bullets, Psychotropic or Psychi Psychiatric Drugs, and the Astonishing Rise of Mental Illness in America. Robert Whitaker, 
was a uh, journalist for new psychotropic drugs hitting the market. And when he came across what he thought were conflicting and, and just wrong statistical data, uh, he was looking at the recovery rate among people diagnosed with schizophrenia here in America and in third world countries. And in a, another third world country, the rate of recovery was so much higher where they had no access to the medicines that he was writing about. And he thought, surely this has to be a, a misprint. This has to be a, some sort of mistake. And so when he tried to track that down, he realized that the recovery rate in those third world countries were actually significantly higher among people diagnosed with schizophrenia. And so that just sent him on a, a trajectory to uncover the truth behind what's actually happening. But here is some of what he had to say just about the statistics starting in 1955. He says, in 1955, the disabled mentally ill were primarily cared for in state, cared for in state and county mental hospitals. Now that's an important date, 1955, because that was when Thorazine, the first antipsychotic drug, was introduced just just the year prior. So Thorazine hit the market in 1954, and so up until that point. This is where people have been cared for who were deemed mentally ill. He goes on to say, today they typically receive either a monthly supplemental security income, SSI, or social security disability insurance, SSDI payment. And many live in residential shelters or other subsidized living arrangements. Both statistics provide a rough count of the number of people under governmental care because they have been disabled by mental illness. This is where we are today. In 1955, there were 566,000 people in state and county mental hospitals. However, only 355,000 had a psychiatric diagnosis, as the rest suffered from alcoholism, syphilis-related dementia, Alzheimer's, and mental retardation, a population that would not show up in account of the disabled mentally ill today. Thus, in 1955, one in every 468 Americans was hospitalized due to mental illness. In 1987, there were 1.25 million people receiving an SSI or SSDI payment because they were disabled by mental illness. Or, and here's the new number, one in every 184 Americans. Quite the difference, isn't it? The Food and Drug Administration approved Prozac in 1987, and over the next two decades, the number of disabled mentally ill on the SSI and SSDI rolls soared to 3.97 million. In 2007, the disability rate was one in every 76 Americans. That's more than double the rate in 1987 and six times the rate in 1955. So you have to ask the question, why are the number, number of mentally ill people increasing if the medicine, the treatment, is also improving? He has a particular burden for... Uh, children caught up in this epidemic. He, he goes on and says, the plague of disabling mental illness has now spread to our children too. In the short span of 20 years, this is from 87 to 2007, the number of disabled mentally ill children rose 35 fold. Mental illness is now the leading cause of disability in children with the mentally ill group comprising 50% of the total number of children on the SSI rolls in 2007. The baffling nature of this childhood epidemic shows up with particular clarity in the SSI data from 96 to 07, whereas the number of children disabled by mental illness more than doubled during this period, the number of children on the SSI rolls for all other reasons, cancer, retardation, etc., declined from 728,110 to 559,448. The nation's doctors, he, he says, were apparently making progress in treating all, other, all those other conditions, 
But when it came to mental disorder, just the opposite was true. Interesting, isn't it? So just the mere statistical data raises serious questions about how we're thinking about this area of life. Now, why is this uh, pertinent to us, right? You can go outside the church and you're just inundated. You hear plenty about mental health. Um, Why just pause for a moment and and do a a couple weeks on this subject? Uh, Just a few reasons. Discernment. Uh, We have to be able to discern this issue because it's so prevalent in our culture. You can't go anywhere and and run or hide from mental health and what is being said about mental health and what's being encouraged by your uh, employer, friends, family, coworkers to do about your mental health. Maybe you have mental health days at work. I don't know, after this couple weeks, maybe you wanna reconsider not taking those or something. But we have to have a better answer as believers than, ah, uh, that doesn't sound right. So that's one reason why to, to do this study. Uh, another, another reason is just from a shepherding perspective. Uh, as you go and step into each other's lives and shepherd one another, you need to have a biblical opinion about these things so that you are better equipped to step into each other's lives and provide counsel and help and support. Uh, And then just from a leadership perspective, uh, the body needs to hear from the elders on this issue to know what what do the elders think? What what does the Bible say uh, from the teachers of this church on this actual issue? And and just thinking about over the years, as Grace Bible Church has grown, um, people bring in to the church whatever their experience is, whatever their background is. Uh, And on this issue over the years, there's just oftentimes misunderstanding about what Scripture says. And so as people appreciate what's being taught at GBC from the Scriptures week after week, uh, this can oftentimes remain, it seems, uh, a subtle error that people hold on to without realizing the biblical implications. And so to just take a, uh, a pointed approach to this issue, I think will be helpful. Uh, what that means ultimately really uh, for shepherding is that <clears throat> if you love the teaching and you want to be at Grace Bible Church, uh, then this is good for everybody to be aware of that th- that area of mental illness that can feel off limits to other members of the body and even leaders, it's not off limits. Not if the Bible has something to say about it. What, what gets called mental illness actually still needs to be shepherded. And it doesn't get to be one of those areas where, yeah, that's between me and my doctor. Thanks, pastor. I'm good. No, it actually has implications for Christian living. And so what God calls us to, and this is something that we'll get to next week, Uh, in greater detail, what God calls us to, the way he calls his people to live sanctified, upright, orderly lives, oftentimes the term mental illness gets to excuse actual disobedience to the Lord. And so we just need to be, be clear about where to draw the lines in those things. So what I want to give you over the next few weeks is several reasons that Christians ought to reject the current cultural understanding of mental illness. Several reasons that Christians ought to reject the current cultural understanding of mental illness. And that's a broad enough heading for me to just basically say whatever I want to say to you from from Scripture, what the Bible says about this issue. Okay, Uh, Christians should reject the current cultural understanding of mental illness. And let me just begin by saying that the term itself according to scripture, is a misnomer. The term itself is a misnomer biblically. Uh, What do I mean by that? Biblically, illness is not a mental issue. Illness is not a mental issue. So those two terms being joined together by the professionals of our day, 
mental and illness just don't belong together biblically. You probably have all kinds of questions. Just, just hang on. Uh, first off, I just want to point you to one passage that actually does, in, in one instance, bring medical language, medical terminology, right into contact with mental life. So open up to Jeremiah 17. You're familiar with this passage probably. Jeremiah 17, starting at verse 9. You could probably quote this, many of you. But in this passage, we'll see that medical language, actual, the actual language of sickness and illness are used right up against mental activity, uh, all to disclose a spiritual reality. So verse 9, Jeremiah says, the heart is more deceitful than all else. I'm reading from the Legacy Standard Bible. And is desperately sick. Who can know it? I, Yahweh, search the heart. I test the inmost being, even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. So here in verse 9, just notice how here the, the adoption of medical language is used to explain spiritual realities. The heart is called desperately what? Sick. That's illness language. That's medical terminology. And just notice what is said to be sick. That first line in, in verse 9 is the heart. The heart. Obviously, this is not talking about the human physical organ heart. But this is that common, often used biblical word to describe the core of who you are. Right? This is command central, where all of your thoughts, your desires, your motivations, all of that begins in your heart. And so this is described as desperately sick, even beyond the point of comprehension. Who can know it, verse 9 says. So beyond all human comprehension, the heart is sick, ill. But this is medical terminology clearly capturing a spiritual reality because the first line says that it's deceitful. It's the deceptiveness of the human heart that's in view. He's not intending, and this is easy to see. He's not intending to say something about the actual sickness, the actual literal illness of the heart, but he's describing a spiritual reality. It's so deceptive that it's called sick in a spiritual sense. Metaphorically, spiritually, it's sick. Now you have other passages uh, similar to this. Isaiah 6 verse 10 is another passage that does this very thing and joins medical language with spiritual realities to explain those spiritual realities. Render the hearts of this people, God tells Isaiah as he sends him to prophesy, unsuccessfully so. <laughs> Go and tell this people, keep on hearing but do not understand. Keep on seeing but do not know. Render the hearts of this people, verse 10, Insensitive, their ears dull, their eyes dim, lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. Again, healed. That's medical language. Uh, and, and they would be healed in the sense that they would then see, hear, and understand with their eyes, ears, hearts. It barely needs explanation that these are all capturing a spiritual reality. Even the reference to see with their eyes, to hear with their ears. Isaiah is not talking to people who are blind, literally, and deaf, literally. But the point is that their eyes aren't working right to see what they should see. Spiritually speaking, they don't see what they should see. They don't hear what they should hear. 
Now, you can just write down Deuteronomy 29, 4, because the same triad is used. Eyes, ears, hearts. See, hear, understand. These are capturing spiritual realities. And in Deuteronomy 29, Moses makes it abundantly clear that to accomplish these things, seeing, hearing, understanding, God must grant a new heart in regeneration, in the new birth, a circumcised heart. And so Moses says there that he has not given that to the people collectively. And so this is as close as scripture comes to saying people are mentally ill. (laughs) But it's capturing a spiritual reality. And I'm sure that you've never heard a single person use the term mental illness to capture a man's spiritual deadness before God because of his own unbelief. We just don't use the term that way. And so this is a misnomer according to Scripture. If we just all of a sudden started referring to mental illness as spiritual deadness, I'd be game. That's not the case. Let me show you a couple passages that actually insist that there is or there is no actual reality um, the way that mental illness is being used. Just go to Proverbs 18. Proverbs 18, 14, and I do think Proverbs is just a phenomenal book to see a lot of what we'll be talking about over the next two weeks. Proverbs 18, 14 makes it clear that mental illness is a misnomer because the mind of man does not get sick. Here, Proverbs 18, 14 says, A man's spirit will endure sickness, but a crushed spirit who can bear? A man's spirit will endure sickness, but a crushed spirit who can bear? In Scripture, what the, the immaterial inner self is captured with a, a, at least a few words. Heart, we've already seen that. Mind, which oftentimes is the very same Hebrew word, lave, as heart, and gets translated in the English, heart or mind, depending on the context. So you have heart, mind, but then also soul and spirit. And if you were to just trace those out throughout Scripture, you would see that they perform the same functions. They have desires, the heart, soul, mind, spirit. They sing, they think. They speak. And so really this is all a reference to the inner self. Sometimes even kidneys would be a, a valid translation of, of uh, the word in the original. Just trying to capture the innermost self, what's most core in you, the heart or kidneys or inmost being, thinking of Psalm 51. Well, here one of those synonyms appears in verse 14. And it says, a man's spirit will endure sickness, but a crushed spirit who can bear. Just some some noteworthy observations uh, on this issue of mental illness. Just notice the first line, a man's spirit will endure sickness. This cannot be said about the body. The body cannot endure sickness. Always. You can't just say carte blanche, the body can handle sickness. The body can endure, survive sickness. No, actually in a fallen world, sickness kills people, right? So here, the, the, there's, there's something true of man. There's something that's, there's a, a component of man that remains unaffected by sickness. And it's the immaterial self, the spirit. The spirit will endure sickness. And so this statement can't be made of the body. It it obviously and clearly focuses on the immaterial self with that term spirit, uh, ruach in the Hebrew, uh, also known as breath, spirit. It's capturing something that's not tangible, right? Like wind. So it doesn't have weight, can't hold it, can't see it, can't touch it, can't feel it, can't hear it, can't taste it. 
this part of man has nothing to do with the senses, or not nothing to do, but it's not the sensory, bodily part of man. And so it, here Solomon writing, can endure sickness. And so in the passage, to make the point that he is making, he has to highlight two different arenas of man's makeup. He's highlighting the material harm done to the body, that sickness in the first line, but then immaterial harm done to the soul or the spirit being broken or crushed. And so the point of the passage is just to say that, hey, sickness affects another component of man than the spirit. The spirit can endure that, but there's something about being heartbroken, crushed in spirit, despondent, depressed, if you will, to use our language, language of our day. That is unbearable. And so we just need to be thoughtful as believers to draw a biblical distinction between those things. Sickness has to do with the body and emotional, mental issues have to do with the soul. Just by a implication, that would mean don't give the secular professional authority over that entire realm known as mental life. Scripture has something to say about that. Uh, What did Jesus say in Mark 2.17 when he's explaining that he came to save the righteous, the sinners, not righteous, to call sinners to repentance, not the righteous? He says, It's not the healthy who need a physician, but the sick need a physician. And so, yeah, if you have something wrong with the tissues of your body, go see a doctor. Do not go see a doctor for your mental life. (laughs) We have scripture, each other, leaders, church leaders for those things. So this is just a misnomer according to scripture. Uh, One other passage you could add to this conversation is James 2.26. James 2.26, as James is talking about the importance of a working faith, faith that works, he just, in passing, kind of makes the point that we want to hone in on this morning. James 2.26, For just as the body without the spirit is dead so also faith without works is dead. Okay, he's making a a point about having a genuine faith that obeys the Lord. But it's interesting to make that point. He uses something that's plain. What dies? The body. The body dies. And to be dead, it has to be absent of a spirit. Uh, The point here is, you think about causes for death, causes of death can include sickness, uh, age, injury. Well, those things have to do with the physical body, and they produce death to the physical body. Taking those same things, sickness, age, injury, you cannot make the soul, the spirit, sick or age or injured in that way. Those are matters that have to do with the the physical self. Now, obviously, you might be thinking of, uh, you know, if if you impact the body in a certain way, thinking about brain trauma, brain injuries, uh, tumors that grow in the brain, bodily illnesses, those things can affect the body in a way that diminishes or affects negatively the functions of the soul, right? Personalities can change due to tumors, brain illnesses, blunt force trauma to the brain. And so it's not like the, there's no connection between the soul and body. But the point is here that we're making is there are two different categories dealing with the material self and the immaterial self biblically. And as believers, we need to be discerning about making a distinction that scripture makes. And when it comes to using the term mental illness, the way it's used in our culture, 
that's just not a, a biblical, uh, biblically faithful idea. Uh, even secular, unbelieving scholars have recognized this wrong use of language to describe the mind as being physically sick. Uh, Thomas says in a book called Psychiatry, the Science of Lies, not subtle at all, but he helpfully says, just, just makes this same point, makes this observation of the error in this language. He says, the distinction between bodily illness and mental illness rests on a misuse of the term illness. When we say that Smith has a mental illness, we misidentify his strategic behavior as a bodily disease, an objectively identifiable physical phenomenon with its origin not directly under human control. If we limit the use of the term illness or disease to observable, biological, anatomical, and physiological phenomena, then by definition, the term illness is a metaphor. Mental illness is a metaphor. Mind is not matter. Hence, mental illness is a figure of speech. The idea of two kinds of diseases, one bodily, the other mental, is an unintended product of the scientific revolution, the, in, the imitation of science called scientism. Hysteria, schizophrenia, mental illness, and psychopathology are scientistic, not scientific terms. And he's right. So it's a misuse of that term illness. This is just one initial re reason if you're looking carefully at scripture to reject what is commonly known as mental illness, it's just a misnomer from the beginning, wrongly named. A second reason to reject the current cultural understanding of mental illness is number two, the term lacks any concrete definition. That term lacks any real concrete definition. And this isn't just my opinion. This is, we'll look at uh, even secular psychologists who say the same. <laughs> so Peter Gray, who wrote a, a very popular introductory book on psychology. This is uh, the book that's used at Ivy League schools like Yale. Peter Gray wrote this as he's trying to define or explain what a mental illness is. A mental disorder is a syndrome characterized by clinically significant disturbance in an individual's cognition, emotion, regulation, or behavior that reflects a dysfunction in the psychological, biological, or developmental processes underlying mental functioning. Mental disorders are usually associated with significant distress or disability in social, occupational, or other important activities. You get it? He's saying a lot, but just notice he hasn't actually told us what it is. He's just said it has to do with these things. It has to do with uh, a syndrome. A syndrome is just a, collect a collection of symptoms. So you have individual symptoms, and when all of those come together, that you call that a syndrome. And the syndrome, th that collection of symptoms, is characterized by what he says are clinically significant, that's an ambiguous subjective term, clinically significant disturbance in an individual's cognition, emotion, regulation, behavior. And he says when that clinically significant disturbance affecting those areas of life are present, then it reflects a dysfunction in these areas, something psychological, biological, developmental process. All you've told us is that you can observe symptoms, and when all of those are present, you assume that what's happening is some sort of dysfunction at that level. But you haven't actually told us what it is. And this is 
this is the textbook, literal textbook way of describing, defining mental illness. Um, this is, is really similar. If, if I ask, what is basketball? And somebody told me, well, basketball involves 10 people, a bouncy ball, they bounce it, they pass it around to each other, and those 10 people, they throw that ball into a circular hoop above the ground as they run back and forth between the hoops. Well, you've, you've described what you're calling basketball, but you haven't actually told me, well, what is it, though? If you're going to define basketball, you've got to at least include that it's a sport, it's a game that involves these things. Okay, so it's a sport, it's a game, and now tell me what's involved. We just lack that when we come to, well, what is mental illness? You can't come to an agreed upon idea of it's this tangible, identifiable, measurable thing, whatever it is, and here's how we know when it's present. It, it works the exact opposite way with real illnesses. We can tell you what cancer is. We can tell you what hypothyroidism is. We can identify the uh, factors that are present when those illnesses are, are happening in the body. They're measurable, identifiable, testable, provable. Even Peter Gray, who accepts this textbook definition, uh, he goes on to recognize that there is no real satisfying concrete definition. He goes on to say this in the same book when he defines a mental disorder. He says, mental disorder has no really satisfying definition. It's a fuzzy concept. Everyone knows that, including the people who wrote the dsm 4 And I would just take a little bit of issue with that because... As this trickles downhill to the hoi polloi, you know, layman, people assume that the higher-ups have come up with a concrete definition. And so when we talk about mental illness, nobody's challenging it. So maybe as an expert, you can, among the higher-ups, say, hey, there's no real definition. But it's not presented that way. Same thing happens with evolution you recognize it's a theory. It's never been really proven because it can't be. But the common man doesn't know that. He's led to believe that this should be assumed as fact. Going on, he says, yet for various practical reasons, he's going to tell us why they've defined it this way. They had to come up with a definition for one thing, insurance companies demand that patients be diagnosed as having a mental disorder if there's going to be reimbursement for treatment. So some sort of definition had to be laid out, no matter how fuzzy the concept. Well, thank you. Thank you for, for recognizing that, for sharing that. And now you have lives that are actually impacted by the consequences of these ideas and the explanation is, well, how are they going to get reimbursed for their insurance costs? So just recognize that even uh, someone with the level of expertise who could write a psychology textbook on, on the subject admits there is no really satisfying definition. Okay, we should take their word for it. <laughs> There's no satisfying definition for what a mental disorder is. And thirdly, for this morning, and finally, a reason that Christians should reject the current cultural understanding of mental illness is that, three, it requires an evolutionary, materialistic anthropology. It requires an evolutionary, materialistic anthropology. Here's what I mean. Anthropology, study of man. What you think about man, what you believe about the way that God has created man, if you accept Scripture's testimony, precludes you from accepting the common understanding of mental illness. The two cannot go together. Because in order to accept what is commonly taught about mental illness, you have to also embrace what culture teaches, what the world teaches about evolution and 
that man is, all he is, is material. There is no soul. There is no immaterial self. All we are is a conglomeration of neurons firing. That's it. Just to, to make this point, consider, uh, again, to quote from Peter Gray, he says there are three fundamental ideas of psychology. And so in his opinion, you reject any one of these and you no longer have psychology. That's helpful for me as a believer, wanting to know what does the world say about this area of mental health and psychology. He's just going to tell me very clearly, remove any one of these, you no longer have what we're describing, the experts, as psychology. Here's his three fundamental ideas. Number one, behavior and mental experiences have physical causes which can be studied scientifically. More on that in a second. Number two, the way a person behaves, thinks, and feels is modified over time by the person's experiences or in his or her environment. And then finally, number three, the body's machinery which produces behavior and mental experiences is a product of evolution by natural selection. You trace out the implications of this. This is how you get the field of psychology, psychiatry. You remove any one of these and you would, have to, you would be undoing much of what is assumed in those fields. Just to look at the first and third fundamental ideas, the first one, behavior and mental experiences have physical causes which can be studied scientifically. You can see the materialistic worldview in that assumption. To say that not only behavior, what we do with our bodies, but then the thoughts, desires, drives, motivations, that would be mental experiences, even those, he says, have physical causes. And those physical causes can be studied scientifically. Now, I don't know all of his motivations in making that claim and holding to that presupposition, but what might be an unbeliever's motivation to make such a claim, to cling to such a statement? Well, one, it would make him able to be the expert on all of mental life. I can explain why you believe what you believe. I can explain why you feel the way you feel. I can explain why you think the way you think because I have my scientist hat on. And so he makes mental life his area of expertise. The church has uh, been an unfortunate uh, part of giving this area to, to the experts um, by saying, you know what, they're right. They, they, do, they are the experts on mental life. They can tell you why you're depressed or why you're anxious or why you're fearful. We, we shouldn't give up that ground biblically. But by saying that behavior and mental experiences have physical causes, he clearly has a materialistic worldview. By saying that they can be studied scientifically, he's made it his area of expertise, not the pastors, not the churches. The third is similar. He says the body's machinery. So this includes everything from your fingernails to your brain. The body's machinery, which produces behavior and mental experiences. That's another way of saying that they have physical causes is a product of evolution by natural selection. So here he would, one of the implications would be if we can study animals uh, and how they think and act, then we can learn much that we need to know about man. So the body's machinery produces mental experiences or mental functions. Uh, this is not a new idea to our day. Uh, one of the, at least by one psychologist's uh, articulation of history, Thomas Hobbes, a famous philosopher, was 
credited with this idea, introducing an idea like this and making it popular. In his book, Leviathan, in 1651, he actually made this case. So just to quote one psychology professor from Yale, Peter Bloom, he says, Hobbes argues that spirit or soul is a meaningless concept and that nothing exists but matter and energy. In Hobbes's view, all human behavior, including the seemingly voluntary choices we make, can in theory be understood in terms of physical processes in the body, especially the brain. Conscious thought, he maintained, is purely a product of the brain's machinery and therefore subject to natural law. This philosophy places no theoretical limit on what psychologists might study scientifically. So you can just see the area of expertise changing hands. Uh, and this is, if you're thinking about the date, 1600s, this is the Puritans era. You know, so you have Puritans writing, uh, sparring with other intellectuals of their day. They're interacting in, you know, with this kind of error even at their time. Thomas Hobbes was condemned by the Catholic Church as a heretic for these ideas. So it was even a problem then. Uh, this gets repackaged in 1962 by the Nobel Prize laureate Francis Crick. Francis Crick, uh, maybe you, you remember, he was, his claim to fame was discovering the shape of DNA, the double helix shape of DNA. And so he was a, a famous, very capable biologist, but he went beyond his biology and he summarized in a book called The Astonishing Hypothesis, what he, what he called The Astonishing Hypothesis. He published this book in 1994, and here is what he said, here was his claim in that book. Francis Crick said, you, your joys and your sorrows, your memories and your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are, in fact, no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules, as Lewis Carroll's Alice might have phrased it, you're nothing but a pack of neurons. This was the astonishing hypothesis. You can boil all life down to the brain, what happens at the level of the brain function. And that's just assumed in our day. If you had to boil down all of life primarily to one component of man, what would you say it is? Here's what Solomon said in Proverbs 4.23, keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. All of the various springs of life, the choices you make, the words you use, the convictions you hold, the thoughts you think, the motivations that you possess, all of that is primarily determined by what? Not your brain. Not your brain, but your heart. The part of you that survives the death of your body, the part of you that must be born again, made anew, so that you know the Lord, embrace the gospel, fear God, that dictates the various springs of life, who you are primarily, not your brain. Just turn to, and we'll close with this, turn to Proverbs 30. As we think about interacting with these ideas, ideas have consequences. Whether you accept or reject this cultural idea, uh, uh, idea of mental illness has tremendous consequences on how you live, how you counsel, how you shepherd, how you parent. And there is protection when we retreat to God's word for the answers. 
Proverbs 30, verse 5. Every word of God proves true. Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. There is great encouragement in this passage to just believe what God says, regardless of how antithetical it is to the culture, regardless of how outlandish it might seem to us. There is protection in believing God and taking him at his word. Look at the second line in verse 5. He, God, is a what? Shield, protection, something worth hiding behind. Not for everybody, but to whom? Those who do what? Take refuge in him. Take refuge in him. And just in this context, how do you take refuge in God? God's not physical. He's immaterial, incorporeal. And so how do you go hide in him, retreat to him for safety? Look at the first line. Every one of his words proved true. Don't add to his words, verse 6, is how you take refuge in God. Just take him at his word. What does he say? I'll believe it. What does he tell me to do? I'll do it. How does he tell me to think? I'll think that way. I'll be convinced of that. That's how you receive the protection that God offers. As believers, you must be eager to embrace what God says about these things. As a church, Grace Bible Church, we must be eager to embrace and shepherd from what God says about these things. And there is a winsome, patient, a uh, persuasive, tactful way of approaching these issues with one another that we need to carefully navigate. But the point is, we cannot capitulate. We can't give ground on adhering to what God says about these things. If we would, then verse 2 would, or verse 6 would prove to be true of us. We would receive the rebuke and be found out to be untrue, to have been lying against God. And we don't want to do that as a church. One biblical counselor, as he's encouraging Christians with the sufficiency of the scriptures to navigate these issues, he says this about God's word. For the Christian counselor, the word of God must be more than an interpretive grid for the acceptance or denial of psychological truth claims. The scriptures have to be more to us than an interpretive grid for the acceptance or denial of psychological truth claims. It, the word of God, is the operative domain from which the counselor derives his or her functional and final authority, being accepted as the determinative authority in anthropology. Scripture serves as the only reliable source for the Christian counselor's diagnostic terminology and remedy. And by God's grace, this will be true of us. Let me pray. God, thank you for articulating these things to us, just giving us, if we're careful to heed your wisdom, if we're careful to read your words and just incline our ears, incline our hearts to receive them for what you've said, then they can give us clarity and light and hope and help, even protection as we run to you, helpless though we are without your words. God, you promise formidable protection to us if we would just seek refuge in what you said. And so give us the strength, the ability, the wisdom to do this. Help us to walk humbly with one another as we draw near to each other and patiently uh, help each other gain clarity on what God says. Uh, Give us boldness to do just that, to patiently step into each other's lives. 
And God, to give your reign, uh, your word full reign over our own thoughts, over our own lives, and to help each other to do the same. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.